Hi everyone, it's Taylor here. Um, as a little precursor to this episode, we just wanted to give you a, a little update. This episode is the last one that we had pre-recorded uh, before major COVID-19 things started happening in the UK. Um, and as of today, Wednesday, March 24th, Kat and I have been separated by the quarantine. She's down in Yorkshire with her family, and uh, I'm sticking it out here in Glasgow with the podcast Gremlin. Uh, we're currently working on getting remote recordings set up and are planning to keep to our weekly release schedule, but we hope you'll bear with us as we try to figure everything out. We hope you're all staying safe at home and taking care of yourself during this crazy time. If you're bored or stressed, uh, you should come hang out with us on social media. Join our Facebook group. You know, this would be a really great time for us to build a, a helpful community of sarcastic true crime weirdos to help pull us all through. Uh, and we also just want to take a minute to give our thanks to everyone out there who's working hard right now in all the key industries to keep everyone else going. If you're a medical professional, a delivery driver, work in a restaurant, providing takeaway, work in a grocery store or a pharmacy, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. You guys are amazing. Uh, keep up the incredible work and please, please stay safe. And with all that said, on to the episode. I'm Kat. And I'm Taylor. And welcome to Square Mile of Murder. Yay. Why do I feel like I always have to say yay after that? It's just who you are. You associate murder with yay. No, 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 <laughs> no. I would like to strike that from the record, please. Fine. And uh, before we start, I have to make an apology. Oh. I have shamed my family. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> so I'm from Yorkshire. We have a very distinctive accent. And outside of Yorkshire, people tend to pretend they can't understand us. So since I moved out of Yorkshire, I've had to soften my accent and I don't have a proper Yorkshire accent anymore. It just comes out when I go back home. <laughs> so I don't know how to do it anymore. <laughs> um, and my family are very offended that I, I've, I'm kind of losing my accent. So fuck you a lot. <laughs> Whoa, I thought this was an apology, not a, a, a rapprochement. Nah, eh, it's kind of bull. <laughs> I, can't, I don't know how to do it anymore. I mean, that's fair. Like, I don't know. I haven't gotten any comments on my accent, but <laughs> that's uh, people probably just assume I'm beyond hope at this point. I mean, that is true. Yeah. <laughs> it does come out when I get really angry, so. Well, so we'll see if, uh, if anything so... brings it out in you today. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Which leads us into uh, this week's topic, and this week we're looking into the life and crimes of a man who has been called Scotland's secret serial killer, one Angus Sinclair. And uh, like his fellow Glaswegian Peter Tobin, Angus Sinclair was a predator of the absolute lowest order his whole life. Understatement. Yeah. So, um, get ready, strap in. It's going to get rough, and uh, don't say we didn't warn you. Yeah. And we also have a special announcement at the end of the show, so stay tuned. Yeah. Hang, hang in there till the end. Born Angus Robertson Sinclair at Glasgow's Rotten Row Maternity Hospital in 1945. Uh, the middle of Angus Senior and Mamie. Yeah, Mamie. Mamie Sinclair's three children. He grew up in the Woodlands area of the city, which is kind of northwest of the city centre. Yeah. Kind of, yeah. Um, so Rotten Row Maternity Hospital is where University of Strathclyde is now, right? Yeah. Yeah. So Rotten Row is a street through the campus now, yeah. I think. Yeah, because there's a big garden there now. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was incorporated into part of the Royal Infirmary, I think. Yeah, yeah. And they shut down the maternity hospital and became part of Strathclyde. Fun fact. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I went to the University of Strathclyde recently, so that's just the only reason why I 
I know that. For I mean, I once Googled it. I was like, where the fuck is Rotten Row Maternity Hospital? Oh, yeah. yeah. It doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I also just think Rotten Row is such a cool name. It's such a great... It's it's awesome. I love it. <laughs> um, so in 1950, Sinclair began school, um, and he attended the Grove Street Primary School across the road from his family home. He was the smallest child in his class and would later be described as an introvert who was at best shunned and at worst bullied by his classmates. Uh, Former neighbors of the family describe him as a strange wee boy from a strange family. That's a bummer. I mean, maybe he just didn't have the best start in life, maybe, or maybe just he was very small. Yeah. Didn't he only, he was only like 5'2 or something? I thought, maybe, I thought he was slightly taller than that, but. He's not not a large man. No. Under like five and a half foot. Yeah. Yeah. So like my height. Yeah. I'm five foot seven, so I'm slightly taller, I'm, I think. I'm five foot four point oh one seven inches tall. You're a shot ass. Yeah. I can't reach the, the <laughs> upper cabinets. That's how tall I am. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get you some nice high heels. Uh, you want me to break my ankle and become shorter? <laughs> Well, we could see how it happens. <laughs> see what happens. <laughs> it doesn't really go with my look, okay? Let's just put it that way. Oh, we could make it work. <laughs> no, Sinclair came <laughs> Sinclair came to the attention of police when he was thirteen. And he was caught stealing from a church collection box. Classy guy. Yeah, I mean that is always the mark of a of a good man. Stole from the church. And shortly after this, he was charged with housebreaking after attempting to burgle a house in the local area. And in his early teens, he became well known in the area for, quote unquote, interfering with younger boys and girls. Uh, He had been caught at the age of 15 and was placed on three year probation for lewd and libidian, I can't say that word. Lewd and libidinous practices? For being a sex pest. Yeah. Uh, And it wasn't long before Sinclair really uh, put the work in and graduated to rape and murder. Less than six months, to be precise. Great. On July 1st, 1961, Angus Sinclair lured his neighbor's seven-year-old niece, Catherine Rehill, into his home while his mother and siblings were out for the day. He lured her in by asking her to get some messages for him in return for a few pennies. Uh, should we uh, explain for our non Glaswegian audience what messages are? Uh, yes, definitely. <laughs> so, getting the messages is going to get the shop in. So, essentially, Sin- Sinclair sending Catherine for some messages basically means he asked her to go to the shop for him. So, it's basically like asking her to run an errand to the shop. Yeah. Um, I only found that out a few months ago what messages meant. I thought it meant going to get the post. Yeah, see, that would make more sense, wouldn't it? Yeah, because I thought it meant, because I kept seeing things like me, like Glaswegian memes, like uh, going to get the messages in your pajamas. And I was like, okay, so like a communal building, if you have like just mailboxes on the ground floor. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's just not that weird. That's just everybody going out into the close, <laughs> getting their mail, going back. Mm. And then I learned that messages is actually shopping. Yeah, I can't say that's that's one that uh that I've seen often before, but I like it. It's mm-hmm. very This city's got a lot of great language. Yeah. Um so when Catherine returned from the shop and entered Sinclair's flat, uh Sinclair attacked her. He sexually assaulted her and then strangled her and threw her barely breathing body down the close steps where she was found soon after by two local women on their way to bingo. Within seconds of Catherine's body being found, Sinclair appeared and offered to call the ambulance, telling operators that she had fallen down the stairs in the close. Um, and in Glasgow or like Edinburgh to like I, I don't Scotland, know. Yeah, maybe, she- um, a close is... A communal area in a tenement apartment building, basically. Yeah. Tenement flat building. Um, it's like the entrance hall stairwell yeah. kind of thing. 
Um, also, can we just talk for a second about how he just like pops up when his, her body is found? He's like, I'll call the ambulance for you. It's like, yeah. dude, calm down. That's really <laughs> suspicious. Yeah. Like everybody knows the first person that's all like, oh yeah, I'll be really helpful is the one that's guilty. Very suspicious. Yes. Yeah. So a close. It's a, is it close or close? I've always heard it close. Close. Yeah. Me, yeah. I think so. Me too. But yeah, it's a, <laughs> when I first got here, it was a very confusing and strange use of the word for me. So teaching a nice bit of Glaswegian as we go along. <laughs> Catherine was rushed to Glasgow's Sick Children's Hospital, uh, but died in the ambulance en route. And um, incidentally, ironically, heartbreakingly, the reason she and her siblings were staying with their aunt in um, the building that Angus Sinclair lived in was because their parents, Patrick and Vera, were in London looking for jobs and a place to live in the hopes of building a better life for their family down in the capital. That really sucks. Yeah. So Sinclair click, quickly, quickly, quickly went into hiding, uh, which was noticed by his neighbors and men in the local community began looking for him. Um, Catherine's aunt, Peggy said if Catherine's uncles had got him that night, they would have strung him up. I mean, that is pretty much the same sentiment where I come from as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think in a lot of places. Yeah. Y- you hurt someone, you want the police to find you because otherwise the family will get to you. <laughs> otherwise you're fucked. Yeah. And luckily for Sinclair, the police got him first. And he was arrested the following day. And on Monday, the 3rd of July, he appeared in juvenile court charged with murder. And he had turned 16 the previous month. So, yeah, still technically a juvenile. Yeah. So is it like a, and you may or may not know the answer to this, but is it like a common thing here to have like adolescents or teenagers charged as adults ever? Um... It depends on their age yeah. and on the severity of the crime. Uh-huh. I'm trying to think of an example. Cuss. Have you heard of the Jamie Bulger case? Yeah. I think, I might be wrong, but I think his killers were tried in adult court. Mm-hmm. But they were only 10 years old. Yeah. Because at one, I think their original sentence was life. And then it was like, you can't try 10-year-olds ad- as adults and imprison them for life. Yeah. Although one of them should never have been let out because all he's done is uh, become a pedophile. Yes, I have, I have read about this. <laughs> uh, that's the only one I can really think of, but it does happen. Yeah, because I feel like you see more uh, in the States where like, it's in a situation sort of similar to this where like a, a teenager of some various age has committed a sort of obviously heinous sort of murder and they're there it seems like they're you're more likely to get like a kid basically tried as an adult for murder than necessarily i've heard of here so i was just kind of thinking about that that's the only one i can think of and that's only because i was reading something about a few days ago about them being tried in adult court Uh but Actually, thinking about it, that might not be tried as an adult. It just yeah, meant it could they were just tried be the, in like the in high a, court or yeah, whatever. Yeah, in the crown court. Well, of yeah. Like a family so court in, or whatever. In answer to your question, I don't know. Okay, well, we'll find out. <laughs> we'll yeah. do some more research. Yeah. Um, yeah, so Sinclair was remanded into custody, and the following month he pled guilty to the culpable homicide of Catherine Rehill, which I want to say is like the Scottish equivalent of like manslaughter. I think it's like a step down it's, from well, it's a step down from murder. Yeah, I think it's similar to to manslaughter, but it's also not really used anymore. Yeah. So I think this is what the nineteen sixties. So yeah. I can't, I'm not entirely sure off the top of my head, but I have. It's not something I've heard um, used much mm-hmm. in more modern cases. So maybe it's one of those um, mm. 
charges are. Yeah, I did Google it the other day and I now can't remember. <laughs> so I was like, culpable homicide. And there was something about it not being used anymore. Yeah. Or, you know, very rarely. So it's probably one of those things. It's like, it's still on the books, but but we don't use that. <laughs> yeah, it's like um, the death penalty for treason. Technically, <laughs> supposedly, it still exists in this country under some very convoluted law somehow Ancient, um, standard yeah yeah but the death penalty is abolished so you're never gonna have someone that's killed. the thing about like the um legal system in the uk is that like most of it's not actually written down so you got a lot of stuff that's like people did it for hundreds of years but like and it's still on technically a law but we don't really we don't really talk about that anymore yeah okay so according to google in Scotland, culpable homicide is committed where the accused has caused loss of life through wrongful conduct, but where there was no intention to kill or wicked recklessness. Okay. So it is no ah, it is an offence under common law and is roughly equivalent to the offence of manslaughter in English law. Okay. So that's why I don't hear I've not heard of it having grown up in England. Okay, that makes sense. So yeah. Culpable homicide in Scotland, manslaughter in England. All right. So, yeah. So he pled guilty to culpable homicide. Um, A psychiatrist said his conduct when the body was found was so normal that in itself it indicated a degree of abnormality. So for this reason, coupled with his age, it was accepted that there was a degree of diminished responsibility. And Sinclair was sentenced to just 10 years and he didn't end up serving that whole sentence shocking yeah what a surprise yeah but i mean like you say the fact that he was just lurking in the close and just popped up like oh i'll go find find the ambulance like that is it's weird creepy it's it's just like i well, i don't think creepy is the right word no it's it's sort of like um it's sinister i think when you yeah. when you really think about it he's what like he's obviously been watching yeah he's waiting for someone yeah. to come find her like he's mm. he's thrown her down the stairs and after he, like inflicting serious damage yeah like despite what what the plea that he pled to mm. you know probably intentionally yeah and like yeah he's he's watching and waiting for someone to just find mm. her and then once they do he's like oh hey listen guys i'm gonna I'll, I'll call I'll, you want me to call you want me to call the ambulance i'm gonna call the ambulance is that okay okay cool hey guys so like it's so he would have happily just stood there and literally watched the life drain out of her yeah if nobody found her yeah exactly so during his short stay at her majesty's pleasure sinclair saw the prison psychiatrist who wrote their report on sinclair a quote I do not think that any form of psychotherapy is likely to benefit his condition and he will constitute a danger from now onwards. He is obsessed by sex and it is to be expected that given the minimum of opportunity, he will repeat these offences. So he's 16 when he's imprisoned. Uh, He only serves six years. So he's 22 when he gets out. That is a very chilling, damning warning. It's like a lot to say. I don't think any form of psychotherapy is going to help this guy. Yeah. That's what I mean, especially at that age. Yeah. To like, say that about someone so young. It's very sort of, yeah, damning, I think is the, the right word. Mm. It's just sort of like, this guy's this is a bad guy. Yeah. And you can't change that, basically. Yeah. Yeah, so he only serves the six years of his 10. Uh, But while he was in prison, um, Sinclair uh, learned to become a painter and a decorator. And once he was released, he started working in the trade. Um, In 1970, at the age of 25, he married a 20-year-old trainee nurse, Sarah. Sarah was originally from Glasgow, but living in nurses' accommodation in Edinburgh when they met. The couple then moved back to Glasgow, and two years later, their son was born. Sarah would later describe Sinclair as an easy man to live with the majority of the time. Generally, they had like a really easy-going kind of home life. She claims to have had absolutely no idea of 
Sinclair's past until, quote, well into their marriage, uh, she says, when he confessed to killing Catherine Rehill. But he described it to her as a tragic accident. And he, he had made a mistake. Catherine had died and then everyone had blamed him for it. And she says, everyone makes mistakes when they're young and it it was just his mistake had tragic consequences and she never thought of him as being capable of being a killer. And I suppose if, depending how he described it to her, I can understand that. Oh yeah. Like, but a tragic accident is your mate's climbing the tree and you're shaking it and your mate falls out and breaks the neck. <laughs> that's, a, that's that kind of tragic accident. Yeah. You don't accidentally rip strangle and then throw an eight-year-old down the stairs yeah and yeah. we should point out that in closes these stairs they are concrete yeah in, like all these old tenement buildings like, they're stone steps and they're they can they're... they can be quite steep as well depending yeah. on the building so it's not yeah yo if if you trip and fall down the stairs you're gonna get even hurt. by accident yeah. you're getting hurt yeah yeah so she thought he was just a nice nice husband guy I had a good life. Uh, but throughout the 70s, Sinclair was sort of living a double life. At home, he was the loving husband to Sarah and father to their son. But outside the family home, he was quickly becoming a career criminal. Um, the couple did have spats from time to time, and Sarah had her suspicions that he might have been cheating on her. And during this time, Sinclair would often stay with his mother or sister until Sarah forgave him and he returned to the family home. Sarah describes, in hindsight, Sinclair as having 10 years of madness in the city of Glasgow. Um, And throughout the 70s, he very quickly came to police attention. Can I just say that, like, if someone is going to write a biography of this guy, 10 years of madness in the city of Glasgow is the title, right? I want that to be my biography. Okay, fair enough. (laughs) I think... (laughs) So what did you do when you lived in Glasgow? Well. <laughs> Ten years of madness. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> I mean, we are sat on your sofa recording a podcast yeah. on murder. So, you know. I think it applies. Yeah, why not? <laughs> uh, yeah, let's see. I'm like three and a half years into my 10 years of madness. So. Yeah, same. Yeah. So. So, yeah. We got some time. We can, we got some we can build on the madness. Yeah. Sinclair became known as a thief, mugger, and housebreaker. Um, so, I'm sorry, but housebreaker has been said a couple times today. Breaking and entering. Okay. So, yeah. burglar. Yeah, but... But not stealing, necessarily. Um, I think specifically breaking into residential properties, huh. I think. I don't know. Cool. I like the phrase. I've just never heard it before. I- I've never thought about it before, so... <laughs> yeah. Uh, on one occasion, he attacked a woman, smashing her face in with a claw hammer. No. She survived. That's good. That's, that's the only positive. Um, and uh, he used to do things like this, you know, armed robbery or armed mugging, whatever you want to call it, didn't really give people the chance to hand over their valuables. It was just like, smash, grab, run it's one way to do it yeah so it's not it's not just the it's not just the thieving it, it's the violence it's the that violence. he's clearly getting off on yeah it's not just the threat of like give me your your money yeah. or i'll whack you you know yeah with the hammer or whatever it's no i'm gonna whack you with the hammer and then i'm then. gonna take your money yeah yeah, it's not even like it's not just the power and control that you'd get just from brandishing a weapon. Yeah, it's that uh, now nah, I'm gonna hurt you first. <laughs> yeah. Ugh. Uh, and on another occasion, he cleaved a man with a hatchet. Ouch. Sounds very painful. Yeah. And again, didn't give this guy the chance to hand over his money. It's nothing to do with them resisting. It's just. It's just violence. They're defenseless, can't do anything, steal from him. Right. 
1979, he was finally arrested again, this time for firearms offenses, and he was sentenced to six months in prison. Uh, at this point, Sarah left him, probably for the best there. Um, unfortunately, the pair reconciled when he was released from prison. Uh, once Sinclair had been released in 1980, the couple put a 3,000 pound deposit down on a house in a new development in South Nitz Hill, uh, which is a suburb of Glasgow, and they eventually bought the house for 27,250 pounds. Now, those of us who were uh, growing up in generation rent, this oh. sounds so cheap for a house. I know, like, I want, I want that. <laughs> but uh, according to the interwebs, uh, three thousand pounds in 1980 would be roughly equivalent to thirteen thousand pounds today, and twenty-seven and a quarter thousand would be about one hundred seventeen thousand seven hundred pounds in twenty twenty. So. so it's not as cheap as we might think. Yeah, yeah. I, I have yet to find this really cheap house in Glasgow. <laughs> yeah, I know. Like, mm, I don't <laughs> think. I mean, there's a one-bedroom tenement, a uh, one-bedroom flat in my tenement building, went for seventy grand a couple of months ago. So. Oh yeah, I, there's a couple in this building that um, I think went for about like one twenty-five. Oh. It's more. They're like yeah, but two you bedrooms. Live, you live in you live in the west end. I live in the east end. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but like, just just to say, you're not buying a house usually in Glasgow for for twenty-seven grand. No. It's not happening. Yeah. So it's, it's just give you a kind kind of an idea of like how much money they had to hand. And while, yeah, they both worked full time and everything like that, there was still a lot of suspicion that there was criminal proceeds uh, involved in buying this house. I could see how that might be the case. You know, the, the uh, hatchet and uh, hammer house, as it were. <laughs> I, I'm just I'm just dreaming of, of a house you can get for 27 grand. Uh, that's nice i think it's called a cardboard box that is an expensive cardboard box what the <laughs> hell was in it just like it's a cardboard box but it's lined with gold no <laughs> <laughs> um so despite sinclair outwardly appearing to be um a reformed criminal setting into settling into suburbia uh, police began to see a pattern of rapes and sexual assaults against young girls in Glasgow. In the summer of 1982, police knocked on the door of the family's new home in South Nitz Hill, and Sinclair was charged with three counts of rape and nine counts of sexual assault. His victims were all aged between 6 and 14. Initially, Sinclair denied all the charges, but later confessed to his wife that he had lost count of of the number of young children that he had raped. That tells you everything you need to know about this guy. Yeah. Um, when asked by detectives how many victims there were, Sinclair re replied, quote, I have done so many, I can't remember all I have done. I honestly can't. It might be 50, it might be 500. If you can find out where and when, I'll tell you whether I did them or not. I mean... What what do you even say to that? There's like th there's nothing you can say. No, there's no response Absolutely. to that. Also, like that's really ballsy to say that to the police who've just charged you with three counts of rape and nine counts of sexual assault of children. Of children. Not that it's any better or worse than if they were adults. Yeah, but but so so that's um. What did I say? Three, so 12 counts mm. in total of various, you know, varying degrees. And then he's like, could be 50 or 500. Those are both larger numbers than what you've just, just been charged for, dude. Like, that's an interesting way to go with this questioning, but okay. He's just... He's scum. Just, yeah, scum. <laughs> I think that's what we call scum. Later that year, at the age of 37, Sinclair would be convicted of 11 counts of rape and indecent assault, and was sentenced to life in prison. And life sentences for rape are fairly rare 
well, they're rare in Scotland. I would say they're rare in say, a lot of pl- in. They're most- probably rare most places. Yeah, which- I mean they shouldn't be. Yeah. However, at sentencing, Lord Cameron was certain that he could pass no other sentence. Quote, the penalty for rape is entirely discretionary and without limit. I have considered very carefully whether a limit should be placed on the extent of the penalty and I have decided there is only one limit, namely your life. That's a good quote. Yeah. Good on you, man. Yeah. That's a very like, yeah, I'll give you a limit. Your fucking lifetime. Yeah. And I don't think enough judges exercise this power. Yeah, and that's interesting though that um, there the like sentencing term for rape is as he entirely discretionary. So, so yeah, you can, and it has happened where people are convicted of rape and they get community service. Yeah, or suspended sentence for like a year. Yeah, or like it is not unknown. So I wonder if that's what that's like in other countries where like i mean i know that in the u.s some people charged or or convicted of rape get like six months of jail time or prison terms whatever but i don't know if there's like a a minimum probably not i don't think there's a minimum because they say people can get six months people can even get suspended sentences yeah or like time served well on trial yeah or if you're really rich you uh get knocked off so you can't incriminate anyone else (laughs) are we talking about one mr epstein here possibly (laughs) i mean there's no way he killed himself but i think in amongst it everyone's forgotten about the fact that he ran an international sex trafficking ring and Let's be clear, sex trafficking is a fluffy way of saying rape. Yeah. It is kidnapping, drugging, and raping, paying to rape underage girls. Yeah. No, I I mean, he's essentially the head of an international pedophile ring. Well, yeah. But everyone likes to use these, like, nice fluffy words, like, oh, it was was trafficking, it was this, it was that, it was fucking rape, and rape's a horrible word for a horrible crime. Yeah. Can you tell this makes me mad? (laughs) Slightly, slightly, yeah. Um, uh, Well, maybe we'll dig into Epstein. We will not. Okay, well. You can. Join me on my solo podcast, Square Foot of Murder. Square Foot? Square Foot. Square fucking acre, if you're going after him. Uh, That's true. No, um, I don't think... That'd be a great idea because it's still being investigated and I don't want to get sued and or killed. <laughs> I completely <laughs> lost where the fuck we are. We've gone off some terrible <laughs> Jeffrey Epstein tangent and I uh, am now brain dead. Um, uh, your line is Sinclair was sent. Ah, uh, yes. So after the awesome Lord Cameron sentenced Sinclair to life in prison for these 11 counts of of uh rape he was sent to the infamous peterhead prison in northeastern scotland um the prison was built during victorian times and peterhead was known as scotland's gulag and had a history of poor conditions you know which is saying something like it was known as poor conditions even for Victorian era prisons, which generally were poor conditions anyway. Yeah, and we're talking about, when we're saying Victoria era, we're talking about the conditions in modern times for a prison built Built. in the Victorian era. Yeah. Not that it was had really... It was bad back then, you know, when it was built. No, like... Like, It was still bad. It was still fucking bad. Uh, Like, a good example of this was electricity only being installed in the prison cells in 2005. Oh, yeah, and there was no wa- running water in the cells until, I think, 2005 as well. Yeah, that's not good. Uh, so Peterhead was also a specialist center for violent sex uh, sex offenders uh, up until it closed in 2013. Yeah, it's not somewhere you want to go. It doesn't sound um, like it. And for 
uh, English listeners might be more familiar with, or might be familiar with Wakefield Prison. Um, uh, Peterhead is kind of Scotland's version of Wakefield Prison, which is also known as the Monster Mansion. And it's where England's most dangerous prisoners are kept. One of them is literally kept in a perspex box beneath the prison 23 hours a day because he is so dangerous they don't know what else to do with him. Yeah, and uh, Peterhead is now a museum to Scotland's prisons, so it's a fun field trip for us one day. This would not be the last we would hear of Angus Sinclair. In the year 2000, uh, there was a cold case review into the murder of Mary Gallagher in November of 1978, and she was found at the bottom of a 20-foot wall near Barnhill train station in the northeast of Glasgow. Yeah, so one Sunday evening, um, 17-year-old Mary left her home heading out to meet two friends, but she would cross paths with Sinclair and never be seen alive again. Sinclair held a knife to her back, made her take off her clothes, um, strangled her with the leg of her trousers, raped her, and cut her throat three times before uh, dumping her body. He also stole her handbag just to... Yeah, because ending her life and defiling her body like that just wasn't enough for her to have the whatever was in her handbag. Gotta do it all. Developments in forensics and DNA meant that the cold case team were able to link Sinclair to Mary's murder. And in 2001, more than 22 years late, Sinclair was finally held to account and convicted. And he received his second life sentence. But uh, Mary's wouldn't be the only cold case from the 1970s, which developments in DNA would link Sinclair to. So going back to October 15th, 1977, which was a Saturday night, um, 17-year-old best friends Helen Scott and Christine Eady were um, having a night out with a group of friends in Edinburgh's Old Town. And they were moving from pub to pub, uh, trying their luck at finding someone who would serve them drinks as, you know, underage patrons. Which, you know, let's be honest, virtually everyone did that at some point. I didn't, but... You didn't get... You never touched a drop of alcohol till you were 21? Not in a bar. Outside of your parents' house? Inside my parents' house. I don't believe you. No, seriously. (laughs) I didn't go out much. I stayed at home a lot. (laughs) I actually believe that, yeah. Um... Yeah, so they're looking for someone to serve them because they were not like me and they were cool. Um, And they ended up at the World's End Pub, uh, which is on the Royal Mile in Edinburgh. You know, it's funny. When I was 16, I could get served because I've got tits. And quite frankly, you know, if you've got tits, you get served. But I had braces put on when I was 17. Yeah. So and I didn't get them taken off till I was 19. So for those two years, well, before I was 18, I couldn't get served. And then once I was 18, I got ID'd everywhere. Yeah. And I was like, like, what happened? So those braces. (laughs) Oh, I still get ID'd now. So like constantly. Well, my favorite is when I was, uh, I went out to a movie when I was still living in New York. So I was probably like 21 at the time. And I went out with my two roommates, um, who were my my age and one is taller than me and mm-hmm. one's about my height so we go to this movie and it's like a pg-13 movie and me and and my roommate anna who are the short ones both get carded for a pg-13 movie and then Vanessa, the tall one, doesn't. So I think they thought, like, she was our babysitter or something, taking us to the movies. Oh, my God. Yeah. And she was the youngest one of all of us. <laughs> Actually, I have, a, I have a better one than that, right? A couple of months ago, I was in um, the little Sainsbury's in the Strathclyde Uni. Mm-hmm. So about half past seven in the morning, Wednesday morning, I think it was, I was getting paracetamol. 
ibuprofen, and a very large bar of chocolate. I got fucking ID'd for the paracetamol. You see a woman, half past seven on the morning, buying paracetamol, ibuprofen, and chocolate. You let her get on with her day. <laughs> Leave her alone. I mean, if you don't understand what's happening in this situation, <laughs> just, just don't interact with the public ever. Yeah, I, I think it's also really funny here, like, that you can't buy scissors and stuff unless you're 18. I was 18 now. It used to be 16. Well, I, I can never tell because, like, it always just comes up as, like, age restric- restricted item or whatever, but, yeah. yeah. You can't buy a Red Bull if you're under 16 or any other oh, energy yeah. drinks. Uh. Um... I have forgot what we were talking about. Yeah. World's End <laughs> Pub. Oh, yeah. And uh, interestingly, <laughs> this is the actual tangent I was supposed to go off on. Yeah. The, <laughs> the planned tangent. <laughs> this is the scripted tangent. We have to script in tangents and puns and things like that. Not all puns are scripted. Let's just uh, point out. Yeah. Some are off the cuff. I was, I was going to try to make a pun there, but I, I couldn't think of one so interestingly (laughs) (laughs) the the world's end pub is called the world's end because it's uh, on the border between the old town and the new town in edinburgh and in the olden days the very olden days it was uh seen as the end of one world and beginning of the other uh, because the old town had quite a different reputation to the uh, upper cl- upper class new town. So during the course of the night, the group was joined by two men, both of whom uh, stuck out from the crowd by the way they were dressed and their distinctive Glaswegian accents, which, if you're not familiar, and unfortunately neither of us have one to demonstrate, but like... Yeah, I can't even... I can't even, like, imitate. No. No, I, so days when I start screaming, get to fuck. Yeah. But I, even then, I can't do the accent. I don't try. But basically, if you're, if you've got a, a, like, a pure Glaswegian accent and you're in the center of Edinburgh, you're going to stand out. Yeah. Because, like, the two accents are vastly different. Yeah. Towards the end of the night, which in the 1970s would have been, like, between 10 and 11 p.m., um, Helen and Christine's friends had been invited to a party somewhere else in Edinburgh, but Helen and Christine decided to stay in the pub and chat with the uh, two men they'd met. Uh, their friends left them in the pub and went on to the party. Uh, no, it's like 1970s, and it was a simpler, more naive time, but even so, there was two of them. It's not like they left one drunk friend with a stranger, you know. It's perfectly reasonable like okay you guys stay here do what you want we'll go so because i have read criticism of like the friends and stuff and i'm like fuck no it happens you know i mean yeah if your friend is drunk don't fucking leave them and uh, on that note it is important to point out that all the in all the documentaries and things i've and things i've read about this case the police are like very adamant they weren't drunk um Helen and Christine were last seen by beat cops on Edinburgh's Royal Mile just after closing time at the World's End pub, uh, and they were in the company of two men when they were seen. You changed it! Because I would never say Bobby's. But that's what they are here. But I don't speak... I speak a different language. Hmm. The next morning, Hillwalkers found Christine's body in the Gosford Bay in East Lothian. Uh, which is about 15 miles east of Edinburgh City Centre, according to Google. <laughs> Before someone comes at me and tells me it's actually 14 and a half. <laughs> right. Helen's body was found six miles away from Christine's in a stubble cornfield. I like that phrase. I'm assuming that just means like it's a, a cornfield that's been harvested or something. Yeah, because yeah. I think this was, was this October? Or November yeah. when this happened? Yeah, October, yeah, October. 15th. So... so yeah, it's been harvested and it's just down to stubble. And there's so many, like some people say it's a stubbled corn field or it's corn stubble field. But so, yeah, it's, um, that isn't, you'll see why that's important in a minute. Uh, both girls were found 
completely naked. They'd both been beaten, gagged, tied up, raped and strangled. And no attempt was made to conceal their bodies. So when that's why, you know, stubble cornfield, a dead body's going to stick out. Yeah, I mean, it's just like a, it's like dirt and little yeah. remnants of corn yeah. plants. Stalks, um, corn stalks. So, uh, despite appeals, neither of the two men who had been seen with Helen and Christine came forward. Police collated a list of over 500 suspects and took over 13,000 statements from members of the public. I didn't know you'd get that many people out in on a Saturday night in Edinburgh in the 1970s. That's impressive. Also, like, that must have taken a long time. Like, that's mm. some... You know, we spend some time on this podcast kind of knocking police for fucking up investigations but th- this investigation and we'll sort of see more evidence of this as we go on but like these guys worked really hard for a really long time on this case and yeah. it's it, it ends up being really impressive the sort of level of effort that went yeah, into solving they, these murders yeah. good job edinburgh police <laughs> um Several witnesses told police that they had seen Helen and Christine talking with the two men in the bar. Um, Speculation that the killings had been the work of the two men increased when it was revealed that the knots used to tie the girls' hands behind their backs were, like, two different types, or not necessarily two, but multiple different types of knots. Yeah, so one of the girls was tied up with one type of knot and the other with the other, with a different type of knot. And, you know, the theory goes that most people only know a couple of One different kind of knot, yeah. Like a couple of different types of knot, and if you're the type of person that ties a lot of knots, you favor one type. Yeah, the other, generally. Apparently, um, what's interesting is Sinclair, while he was in prison from ages 16 to 22, so he learned to do like painting and decorating, mm-hmm. but he also learned to make fishing nets, and he learned a bunch of knots in the process of that. Oh, so. You know, that's also something that could have potentially pointed towards him. In May 1978, police announced that they were scaling back the investigation. And unfortunately, the case went cold for 20 years. In 1997, a cold case review of the case undertook forensic examination of the girls' clothing, uh, reflecting the advancements in forensic and DNA technology since the 1970s. And they managed to isolate a male profile, which was found on both girls. I think that's that's amazing. I mean, before we started recording, we were talking about how, how, just, just them having the thought, 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 of keeping these samples properly stored and everything yeah. like that. Because, I mean, DNA as a forensic science is a new thing, but it has been, it was discovered in like eighteen sixty. Or the 1860s sometime. Yeah. And from the 1950s onwards, they did sort of know. They knew it had potential. They just didn't know how it worked exactly. Yeah. But, you know, even in the 70s, they knew that one day. Yeah, like so- at some point. It's going to be useful. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I was listening to a podcast that was talking about sort of the investigation. And um, they mentioned that basically this one forensic technician who was assigned to this case as um, at like a really early point in his career when he was quite young, basically took on the task of making sure the evidence for the world's end murder was properly maintained and stored and, you know, all that chain of custody stuff. And like throughout his entire, you know, 30 year career or whatever, he maintained it and like that's i just kind of love that because that's really cool and it's like i love that kind of dedication and commitment and if you're going to law enforcement or working adjacent to law enforcement in that kind of field you should have that commitment yeah you know his work and and people like him involved in this case they're the reason that ultimately we we got a resolution out of it yeah so you know Good job, guys. Yeah, good job. Keep keep up the good work. Yeah. 
If we find his name before we start editing, we'll drop it in. I think it was Lester Nix or... um. Oh, here it is. Um, Lester Nib, K N I B B. Mm. Yeah, and uh, one in nineteen ninety seven, when they uh, generated this profile, they compared it to the DNA from all five hundred of the original suspects. But I mean, the fact they didn't find a match, and unfortunately, the case went cold again. But dedication, yeah, like, dude. <laughs> Holy All shit. All 500 of the original suspects. And I imagine some of them by that time would have died. So they'd have had to use like familial DNA. Yeah. yeah. So that is, that is good, good work. Yeah. That was super, super duper impressive. Yeah. Um, so that was 1997. In 2003, BBC's Crime Watch program broadcast a reenactment of the night. And police received calls and tips from more than 130 people who hadn't come forward during the original investigation. So over the next year, police enlisted the help of the Forensic Science Service to try and identify the person uh, whom the unknown DNA sample belonged to. And the sample partially matched over um, 200 profiles in the National DNA Database. Uh, In November 2004, police took DNA swabs from Angus Sinclair which matched the unknown sample. And the following March, he was arrested and charged with the rape and murders of Helen Scott and Christine Eady. He entered no plea and was remanded in custody. But as he was already serving two life sentences, he wasn't going to get bail, was he? (laughs) No, I don't think so. (laughs) Uh, His trial began in August 2007, and the prosecution alleged that on the night of the 15th to 16th of October... 1977, Angus Sinclair and Gordon Hamilton pursued or forced the girls into a motor vehicle near the World's End pub. They then drove to Gosford Bay and there or elsewhere attacked, stripped and gagged Christine with her own underwear, tied her wrists before raping her and then killing her by restricting her breathing. So they strangled her. Yeah. Uh, he was further accused of raping and murdering Helen in the same way. Um, so, Gordon Hamilton, who whose name just popped up there, um, he was actually Sinclair's brother-in-law, so um, Sarah's older brother. Uh, but Hamilton had died in 1996 and couldn't be indicted along with St. Clair for these murders. Yeah. Sarah also had a younger brother called David, who was known to have helped St. Clair commit violent attacks and burglaries in Glasgow in the 1970s. So St. Clair robbed with one brother-in-law and murdered with another. You know, families that crime together. Keep it in the family. Yep. Um, Although neither Gordon nor David were ever convicted of any crimes associated with St. Clair, uh, despite... David having confessed to armed robbery. Sinclair pled not guilty to rape and murder, claiming he and Hamilton had both had consensual sex with both girls in the back of his van. And then the girls got out and they'd never seen them again. Uh, The prosecution did not present any witnesses. Uh, The case was based solely on the DNA profile and circumstantial evidence. Yeah, so um, on September 7th, Sinclair's senior counsel... Edgar Prius, Prius, something like that. Yeah, um, QC Queen's Council um, submitted that uh, the prosecution had no case due to an insufficiency of evidence, and like the technical legal term for that here in Scotland, it's like the defendant had no case to answer to is like the the phrasing. Yeah. Which is kind of an interesting. He doesn't have to answer to this. It's like, yeah. I, I refuse to dignify that with a response. <laughs> um, so the uh, council contended that the Crown had failed to present evidence that Sinclair had acted with force or violence against the girls and could not prove that any sexual encounter between Sinclair and the girls had not been consensual. 
And it's since been reported that when asked how he knew the sexual encounters he and Hamilton had with each of the girls were consensual, Sinclair replied, they didn't say the word no. Let that sink in. (sighs) Not because they said yes. Not because I asked. Nothing to do with positive confirmation. His version of consent is that, well, nobody said the word no. Yeah, so, you know, if they fought back, said, get off of me, leave me alone, fuck off, screamed, anything. Like, even with all of that, he's he's deciding that's still consensual because just, you know, one word wasn't said. Yeah, I mean, just, just fuck this guy. Just, like, fuck off. And when you get there, fuck off some more. Then some more after that. Just a little bit more. On September 10th, 2007, the trial judge, Lord Clark, upheld the defence submission of no case to answer and formally dismissed the case, drawing widespread criticism from the British public. Sinclair was then returned to hell. Uh, did I say that? I meant Peterhead <laughs> Prison. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so the case was dismissed, but that wasn't really the end of the story. So, you know, let's... Let's take a second here and uh, take a little side trip down Double Jeopardy Lane. Um, it sounds like, like, I don't know, it sounds like a cool, like, album title or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's our next project. <laughs> um, yeah, so, like, if you listen to a lot of true crime podcasts or are into true crime, you already know what this is, so I'm really sorry that we're about to explain it but if you're not familiar um double jeopardy basically if you've tried a case and that trial has come to an end and it's been dismissed or it's you know you've been found not guilty basically the law says you can't be tried for that crime again um which is ultimately like really frustrating in the age of you know increasingly better forensic technology and cold cases and stuff yeah um which is actually what led to in well in the uk what led to the review of the double jeopardy law yeah so in 2008 the scottish law commission published a report on the principle of double jeopardy and the commission recommended that double jeopardy be retained in scottish law but that it should also be reformed so the commission um further recommended exceptions be made to the double jeopardy principle in certain circumstances one of which was the discovery of new evidence so uh, and that would mean new evidence that was found after the first trial has concluded not evidence that was included in like the the first trial yeah so you couldn't hold back evidence and then Oh, they're found not guilty. Oh, look, oh well, look, we, we, we had missed this. something. Yeah. yeah, it's got you've got to prove that it's it's something completely new that's been that's found been recently. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Otherwise, you are starting to sort of air into the, you know, kind of into the territory of what double jeopardy was origin was. Yeah, originally put in uh, place to just, yeah. guard against. No, it's uh, well, we'll just try them again because we didn't. Yeah, we'll get try the... them on this other line of mm. you know, line of thought. Yeah. Um, so following this report, the Scottish government introduced the double jeopardy parentheses Scotland close parentheses bill. <laughs> you all fancy with your fancy ass brackets. <laughs> um, on October 7th, 2010, which addressed the issue by introducing three specific instances where a person could be tried again. These instances are uh, number one. Where the acquittal is tainted by offences against the course of justice. Number two. Where previously acquitted, where the previously acquitted has made a credible admission of guilt. And number three. Where evidence which was not and could not with ordinary diligence have been available at the trial has now been found. Yeah. So. So. We've now got this in in the law in scotland um and in a 2012 press release um 
it was announced that the case of Helen Scott and Christine Eady was reopened following the passing of the uh, Double Jeopardy Act. On the 15th of April 2014, the Crown was granted permission to bring a new prosecution against Angus Sinclair. And in October 2014, Sinclair's second trial for the World's End murders began. On November 14th, Sinclair was finally found guilty of the murders of Helen Scott and Christine Eady in 1977. In sentencing, Lord Hugh Matthews sentenced Angus Sinclair to the longest prison term ever handed out in Scotland. Life in prison with a minimum term of 37 years. And when he announced this, apparently there was like a gasp and like a chill went through the courtroom because 37, 37 years in prison is one year for every one year in prison for every year the families have had to wait for justice. So nobody missed the the symbolism, the symbolism there. behind that. No, I and think that's great. Uh, this would mean that Sinclair would not be eligible for parole until he was 106 years old. And um, this case also made history in that it was not only the oldest case to be prosecuted, Mm -hmm. uh, it was also the first to be prosecuted under the new Double Jeopardy law. Yeah, which is kind of cool because, like, basically this case is one of the main reasons why they looked at reforming the law to begin with. And then... And it's proven it's worth. Yeah, it's, you know, turned out it was a good thing that they did that after all. Yeah. Um, so besides the world end murders and s- sort of the string of rapes that Sinclair was, uh, convicted of, uh, he's also been connected with a number of unsolved murders in Glasgow from 1977, which were identified during Operation Trinity, uh, o- open to examine unsolved murders similar to that of Helen and Christine. Uh, Hilda McCauley, Agnes Cooney, and Anna Kenny were abducted on separate occasions whilst on their way home from nights out with friends in Glasgow in the autumn of 1977. All three women were found undressed, bound, and gagged with items of their own clothing in various sites throughout the Scottish countryside. Um, The World's End murders took place in the middle of these three murders, you know, with virtually the same M.O., and not only was the these three, uh, just months before the murder of Hilda Macaulay, another woman from Glasgow had been found murdered in exactly the same way in Glenboig, which is northeast of Glasgow. 37-year-old Frances Barker. And this case was officially solved and uh, a already convicted violent rapist uh, Thomas Ross Young was uh, convicted for Francis's murder, but uh, Thomas Ross Young, Thomas Ross Young was a known criminal associate of Angus Sinclair, and due to the similarities with the other five murders, many believed that Sinclair was involved. Uh, unfortunately, unlike the case of Helen and Christine, all of the forensic evidence uh, that was recovered from Hilda, Agnes and Anna's murder scenes has been lost in the intervening years so they didn't have a uh, less than nib <laughs> to uh, ensure that this DNA was uh, preserved uh, for future examination um, but also nobody seems to know how or why it just disappeared yeah, it just disappeared, which isn't uncommon in some older cold cases. Sometimes by accident, sometimes things mysteriously disappear. Yeah. Sometimes people just don't think it's ever going to be solved and it goes, it just disappears. Yeah. Um, uh, so nobody has ever been convicted, but uh, in sort of recent years in cold case reviews nobody else has or nobody else that we can find uh has been sort of seriously considered uh, in connections with the meds of hilda agnes and anna and uh, it's also worth noting that thomas ross young was convicted of francis's murder very quickly mm. so it was before 
um before the other five killings the five in glasgow and the two in edinburgh um which is why he's not suspected of any of these yeah being involved with those yeah in july 1979 the body of another of sinclair's criminal associates pornographer eddie catogno was found in his burning home in dumbarton west of glasgow so crime scene investigators quickly realized that he had not died as a result of the fire uh and it was determined that he'd been bludgeoned to death and the fire was set uh to cover up that fact basically i I also actually read that whoever set fire to it didn't actually do that good of a job because the fire didn't spread very quickly Mm. um whether he was using as an accelerant just should go and get your money back mate (laughs) and uh police got um uh, firefighters got there so quickly that they were able to to sort of preserve the body almost before oh, yeah. the fire got to him which is how they know he was murdered nice mm. um so sinclair and eddie had fallen out a few months before his death um over their pornography business so sinclair would find women um and bring them to eddie uh who would then take and develop pornographic photos of them um i mean it's just really a precursor to lad lads mags really isn't it yeah as long as as long as those women are there willingly yeah which as i realize as i'm saying that that could be very far from the truth um quite possible that they were not yeah um since 1979 almost all uh evidence from this case has been lost and eddie catogno's death remains unsolved there are also a growing number of online sleuths who believe that sinclair could be responsible for the murders of patricia docker jemima mcdonald and helen puttock in 1988 19 19- <laughs> in 1968 and 1969 more commonly known as the bible john murders and we're not going to go into detail on that now because we're going to cover that in our bible john episode so that's going to be a bonus episode yes um yeah so we'll get into more of that later stay tuned (laughs) uh sinclair died on march 11th 2019 so just over a year ago at glenock hill or glenock hill we are not entirely sure prison uh, near Alloa in Clackmananananananshire, <laughs> which is a very small county in Scotland, and you rarely hear about it, and that's why no one knows how to say it. Clack uh, Clackmananshire, Clackmananshire. Like I want to just not say the middle. Nan. I want. Yeah, I want to call Clark it Man. I want to call Clark it Clackmanshire. Yeah, but I don't think which that's I actually, right. I actually thought that's what it was, and then I realised I just read it wrong, and I was like. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> so, so close. Yeah. Clackmanananshire. Uh at the age of 73. Uh so because he died in prison, the courts are legally required to carry out a fatal accident in- inquiry. And the Sterling Sheriff Wiley Robertson or possibly Willie Robertson, it's spelled with a y, so that's confusing. Yeah. Um So the sheriff set the inquiry date for March 4th, 2020. And so by the time uh, this episode goes out, uh, that will have started. And um, we'll keep you updated about, you know, what's happening with that on our social media. If there's anything sort of at all interesting. Might not be, but... I don't think there's going to be anything from what I'm about to read out. Yeah. Yeah. Um... I, for one, did not know that they had to carry out a fatal accident inquiry into every prisoner who dies in prison. No, me neither. I, I mean, I knew they'd have to be, like, a post-mortem and everything like that to make sure there wasn't foul play. Mm-hmm. But I didn't realize I had to go, like, for a full inquiry. Especially because, so he was 73 when he died, and he had a stroke a little while ago, too, and was, like, basically under 24-hour care and couldn't do pretty much anything for yeah. himself so it's not like he just showed up dead in the prison yard one day no like it, yeah. he was mm. not well 
and then died. And uh, Sheriff Robertson said of the case, quote, I've seen the medical records, prison records, and the autopsy report. It's quite clear from all the papers I've read and what has been agreed that he died of natural causes and there's no case, there's no issue arising in relation to the care of the prison service or any other parties. Unfortunately, we still have to fix a hearing. Fair enough. Uh, Sinclair's family have told the Crown Office that they have no intention of attending the inquiry or participating in any way, uh, with the exception of his mother, Mamie, who stood by her son uh, and protested his innocence from his first conviction right up until her death in 1987. All of Sinclair's family have uh, disowned him. His sister, Corinne, and niece, Heather, also stood by Sinclair for years and um, up until his 2001 conviction for the murder of Mary Gallagher. And that is the case of Scotland's secret serial killer, Angus Sinclair. Thank you for listening. Yeah. um, And, you know, we sort of say thank you for listening at the end of these episodes, and it seems kind of like just a thing you say, but, like, seriously, thank you for listening. It's Because otherwise it's just two idiots talking into a microphone on a Wednesday afternoon. Yeah, into the void, basically. And it's actually Thursday. <laughs> oh, shit, yeah. Um, um, it means i got to go to work tomorrow. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so we really appreciate anyone who's listened to any single bit of us rambling on. Um, yeah. And we'd love for you to get in touch with us on Facebook or Instagram and let us know your thoughts about the case, you know, this case or other cases that we've covered. And if you're enjoying the podcast at all um we'd really appreciate it if you subscribed and or possibly left us a a rating and reviewing us um on either like apple podcasts or wherever you listen you know if if that function is available in the app that you use yeah Yeah. preferably five stars we're not greedy or anything uh, that'd be nice yeah yeah but you know, no, no pressure. <laughs> and now, our special announcement. Yes, yes, mustn't forget. Yes. Um, so when this episode uh goes live, we will have officially launched our Patreon page. Yes. It's very exciting. It is. It is very exciting. If you like what you've been hearing um on the podcast and uh you'd like to help support us making and creating a said podcast then you can um waddle on over to uh our our patreon and check it out um we have a bunch of different uh tiers at all different price levels with with some cool uh perks and bonuses and stuff um yeah, so head on over to patreon.com forward slash square mile of murder. Yeah. And because we're feeling extra generous, our first Patreon bonus episode is available to all price tiers. Yeah. And our first bonus episode is going to be the mysterious and unsolved death of Alyssa Lamb at the Cecil Hotel in uh, downtown Los Angeles. Um, it's a really weird uh creepy case and we had a lot of fun talking about it anything that comes through the patreon is gonna get put right back into the podcast and and trying to make it better and 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 helping us sort of uh improve and spend more time on it and um we you know really appreciate everyone who's listened at this point um yeah, all the comments, yeah. reviews, uh, any any sort of uh, you know, shares, likes, whatever on social media and you know, if you've you've uh, pestered your friend to go listen to these two uh, crazy ladies talk about murder for <laughs> way longer than they probably should be. <laughs> um, yeah, it's super yeah. cool and you know, we're recording this uh sort of a little bit in advance of when uh you're going to hear it but because some people are sodding off to america for two weeks maybe um the rest of us have to stay in glasgow <laughs> but like just looking at the numbers for the first um three episodes that are live 
and, and now there's four, but that just went up today. Um, there's like 70 to 100 of you guys. And yeah. that's, <laughs> that is more than we thought. That's more people than I know. So yeah. some of you, I don't know. And so that's yeah. crazy. <laughs> like, yeah, it's not just our friends we made listen to this. <laughs> what are you doing here? You're not just my mom. Um, so it's super cool. And and we, we really love you guys. And, and we love that you're wanting to get involved. And so come check out the Patreon. Come um, check out... Uh, we've got a Facebook community group as well yes. that we'd love to really get get going and um, get more people involved in uh, so we can talk to everyone. And yeah. Um, yeah. So check it out. And our payment tiers start at $1 a month. Yes. So real, real, real easy entry level. Yeah. Um, and uh, you can also find all the Patreon stuff through our website squaremileofmurder.com there's a link on the homepage so it's it's easy yeah. access so yeah go check it out and hopefully our next episode we'll be able to shout out some names yes that's one of the tiers yeah head on over and uh show some love for your girls <laughs> yeah come come hang out with us online please yeah maybe even one day in person maybe if we if we get to that point yeah um yeah so uh check that out come at us on social media and all that fun junk and uh thank you so much for listening yeah thank you uh motorcycle yeah i'm annoyed i can't see it i want to see what it looks like <laughs> it sounded cool it did <laughs> so um stay tuned and uh we'll we'll see you next week. Yeah. Bye. Bye.